The subcommittee uh, on communications technology will now come to order. Uh, I'd like to thank all our witnesses for being here. Before recognizing myself for an opening statement, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter the following documents into the record. And they are a letter from the American Cable Association, a letter from the MPAA, an article by Scott Galloway on Esquire, a letter from the Consumers Union, a letter from Ride TV. So, and also a letter from Recording Industry Association of America. Thank you. If no objections, so ordered. Good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing on Modern Media Marketplace. The goal of today's hearing is to develop a factual record so we can be informed on the state of the dynamic media market. The ways that consumers interact with media and the types of content available have changed significantly in a relatively short amount of time. As we have worked to bring broadband to more Americans, we have seen consumers increasingly use digital devices to enjoy unprecedented access to a variety of content. Not only has this resulted in more choices for consumers, but it also has led to innovation in the media market, specifically in the digital space. Traditional media providers and new entrants alike have invested heavily in digital media platforms, offering new distribution channels to content creators. This innovation has also led to increased competition. This helps keep prices for co content affordable for consumers. It is critical that the committee be informed on this important topic, and with that, I welcome all of our witnesses here today and I look forward to your testimony. At this time, I yield two minutes to Mr. Scalise, the whip. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pleasure. Appreciate you yielding to me. And I uh, want to also thank uh, Chair Blackburn for putting this hearing together on the video marketplace. I uh, also want to thank our panelists for being with us today. Uh, while this hearing will cover the media landscape as a whole, I look forward to hearing from the panel about their viewpoints about the video marketplace. I don't think anyone here would disagree with the fact that the way American families watch television has changed. The question is, do our current laws and regulations match up with the modern marketplace? I would argue that they don't. Much of the legacy pay TV industry that we use today is governed by the 1992 Cable Act, when this was the smartphone. And I think if you look at this device, it might have worked as a smartphone back in 1992. I can't even get it to connect to a local provider today uh, because things have changed. In fact, if you compare your smartphone of 1992 when the current laws that we're operating under were written, this is the smartphone of today. Uh, this can do a lot more than an entire room of microprocessors could have done in 1992. Uh, so, what you have to look at is how are consumers getting their video? And the choices that they have uh, have to be viewed against the regulations and the laws that are out there. An entirely new universe of choices for consumers has been unlocked thanks to advances in technology and agreements reached by companies through free market negotiations. So rather than continuing to settle for predetermined outcomes based on decades old rules, I've introduced my legislation called the Next Generation Television Marketplace Act, which will empower consumers by enabling a truly free market approach to video content and leveling the playing field across the market, instead of government picking winners and losers, which is what the case is today. This hearing is a good starting point, Mr. Chairman, as the committee begins its work to reauthorize Stella, which expires at the end of next year. I look forward to continuing my conversations with all the relevant stakeholders in support of a more free market and consumer-driven approach to the video marketplace. Look forward to the questions later, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman from Louisiana, and uh, the chair now recognizes subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Doyle, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and thank you to the witnesses for your testimony today. 
Uh, before I start, Mr. Chairman, I'm concerned that more than a year and a half into this Congress, we are just now talking about the state of media marketplace, and we're doing so with a very broad brushstroke. Uh, I don't believe that this hearing or the panel before us will give us our members will give our members sufficient opportunity to address the multitude of changes that have occurred since the last time we held such a hearing. I sincerely hope that this hearing is just the beginning of a much broader and deeper investigation into these changes. That issue aside, I have many concerns about the state of the media marketplace. It seems that the only constant in the media marketplace is change. In the video market this year, we have seen both vertical and horizontal consolidation in the forms of the ATT, Time Warner, and Disney 21st Century Fox mergers. We have also seen a continued trend of consumers cutting the cord on traditional pay TV options as they embrace the over-the-top options such as Netflix, Amazon Prime, as well as virtual MVPD options such as Sling TV, PlayStation View, and others. These new options often provide consumers with greater choice and lower prices. Virtual MVPDs offer the added benefit of finally letting consumers provide their own set-top box, freeing consumers from hundreds of dollars a year in fees, and eliminating a particularly annoying pain point for video subscribers. However, the advances in this market are threatened by the FCC's repeal of net neutrality rules. ISPs slowed over-the-top services such as Netflix in the run-up to the 2015 rules, and it was only due to the public outcry and the rules that were put in place under Chairman Wheeler that enabled Netflix and other streaming players to end the slowdowns they were experiencing. These rules provided the regulatory certainty for other players such as PlayStation View to enter this market knowing full well they would be competing directly with MVPDs over their own broadband connections. Since Chairman Pai took over at the FCC, he has repealed the Commission's net neutrality rules and ended the investigation into anti-competitive zero rating practices by ISPs. In the wake of these decisions, multiple ISPs have taken to zero rating their own video streaming products while forcing consumers to use data from their limited data plans. As Mr. Moffitt points out in his testimony, many of these new players operate at a loss. These new entrants are then forced to compete against ISPs that are giving their own services an unfair advantage. These practices by ISPs do not incentivize innovation or competition, and they're not in the public interest. While I'm encouraged by this nascent market, I believe that Congress should be examining how these markets have been affected by the regulatory vacuum created by the FCC's actions in far more depth and with the affected stakeholders. I'd like to shift to the market for over-the-air television, including a slew of harmful regulatory changes by the FCC, from reinstating the UHF discount to eliminating the main studio rule these changes undercut our commitment to localism and only serve to circumvent congressionally set broadcast ownership limits. I fear that despite Sinclair's failed merger, that these changes will continue to negatively affect the broadcast market for years to come. Now, the Commission is contemplating making changes to broadcasters' obligations under the Children's Television Act. These rules, otherwise known as KidVid, require broadcasters to air children's programming weekly. The Commission is claiming that these rules that have led to the creation of thousands of hours of high-quality, safe educational programming can be tossed out the window without harmful consequences. I'm glad that we have Jeff Corwin here testifying regarding these proposed changes. It seems to me that the Commission's proposal could have a devastating effect on the creation of new children's television content and should be looked at with great skepticism. I believe that much more examination of these issues is warranted by this committee. Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania. I now recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Walden, for five minutes for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having this hearing. I want to welcome our witnesses as well. Uh, to talk to us about the rapidly changing state of the media marketplace. It goes without saying that consumers in 2018 have unprecedented access to high-quality media content. 
From the smartphones in their pockets, Americans can watch hours of television programming and YouTube videos, stream millions of songs and broad, uh, podcasts, and pursue endless hours of content all over social media. My, how things have changed. New platforms and variety and content have changed the way consumers spend their time and money, and the industry is responding to those consumers accordingly. The Energy and Commerce Committee has long conducted oversight on this topic, and a lot has changed over the years. In fact, in 2007, this committee held a media marketplace hearing, and the topics of discussion were the DTV transition and traditional media platforms transitioning to access on the Internet. I think we also talked about coupons then, too, so you could buy that little box. That same year, Netflix announced the launch of a streaming service to compete with Blockbuster. That was the nation's largest provider of video rentals at the time. Well, fast forward to 2018. More people watch Netflix than any other cable network, and Blockbuster has closed nearly every one of its stores. I say nearly every one of its stores because there is one remaining store, Blockbuster store in America, and it happens to be in my district in Bend, Oregon. But wait. It could be pure coincidence, I'll defer to our expert witnesses, but this Blockbuster store also brews beer. So talk about a new business model in the video marketplace. So, and it's not just the video marketplace that's transformed. In early 2000s, revenue from online music streaming was just a few million dollars. In 2017, Spotify alone reported almost $5 billion in revenue. <clears throat> and on-demand audio streaming now accounts for 54% of total audio consumption. Ten years ago, smartphones were new to the market, and Americans largely used their mobile devices for calling and texting. I wasn't here, but you still got your brick phone, right? It's kind of amazing Scalise still uses that and hasn't gone to one of these. The deployment of modern wireless technology revolutionized the smartphone market, and today Americans spend on average about three hours a day on these mobile devices. Nearly every network, national newspaper, major radio station has an app, and consumers have access to content anywhere, anytime. Changes in how we interact with media have caused a ripple effect on other industries as well. For example, the rise of over-the-top video streaming services has resulted in dramatic increases in demand for both fixed and mobile high-speed broadband. Online video consumption made up 69% of global internet traffic in 2017, and that number is expected to increase to 80% by next year. Changing consumer habits have also had a profound effect on the advertising industry. Ten years ago, marketers used digital platforms to interact with potential customers. But advertising dollars were primarily spent on traditional platforms. Today, brands are investing more than a third of their advertising budgets in the digital space, while print and radio account for less than 10% of total ad spend. Much of this shift can be attributed to mobile and social media ads. Non-existent 15 years ago, combined advertising through these mediums are expected to reach $55 billion in 2019. Now, we have seen unprecedented concentration in this ad space. In 2017, Google and Facebook dominated the U.S. digital market, taking a combined 63% of total ad investment. In the U.S., no other digital ad platform has a market share above 5%. And all signs indicate this duopoly will continue to dominate this market. While the rise of digital platforms have threatened traditional business models, there's no denying that evolving consumer habits and new market entrants have fueled a fiercely competitive media market. The largest traditional TV networks invest up to $10 billion a year in non-sports programming, and billions of dollars of venture capital have been invested in content creation for online platforms. So it's an exciting time as a consumer. It can be an uncertain time if you're in the business. We have an excellent panel of witnesses, and I appreciate you being here. You know, I was talking to some people the other day, and they were asking about what time some show came on television, and for their kids, there is no such thing as time something comes on. They just click on their iPad, and there it is. And I, I remember going to a video conference, a video futures conference the NAB had back in 2004, I believe. And uh, they talked about time shifting and how Walter Cronkite uh, may not come on just at, you know, dinner time. You could get him any time. And uh, that was sort of out of the realm of possibility to our thinking then. And now we just get the news whenever we want it on whatever platform we happen to have with us. So lots have changed. Our job is to make sure that Internet works and that people have connectivity and we've done a lot in this committee to make that happen as well. Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing. I yield back.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, now I'll recognize uh, uh, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Prolone, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The way Americans consume media and the variety of content available to them has grown significantly over the past decade. In addition to traditional television and radio, consumers are using their phones, computers, smart speakers, and tablets to access a variety of programs, podcasts, and videos. And today, anyone can become a producer of content. Over 400 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute, and over 1 billion hours are viewed every day. Last week, a woman in DC posted a Twitter on Twitter, a short video of Marines running to help residents in an apartment fire a few blocks from here. News organizations quickly started using the clip in their on-air stories, and two days later, the footage was used by the Marines in a tweet about the heroic efforts. And this is the dynamic world that we live in today. But at the same time, it's important to remember that not everyone has equal access to the latest technology. It's too easy to focus on the benefits of broadband, new media, and multitude of cable and satellite TV channels and forget how many people lack access to such opportunities. And this includes lower income families and seniors. According to the FCC Commission's 2017 Media Industry Report, 11% of television households relied exclusively on over-the-air broadcast service. That's 12.4 million households, a million more than the year before. According to the National Association of Broadcasters, over-the-air reliance is higher among low-income families, and for these families, paying for cable may take a back seat to feeding their kids. Meanwhile, broadband, which is necessary to access a growing wealth of educational, social, and entertainment content, also faces an economic and age divide. According to Pew Research Center, only 45% of people making less than $30,000 and 50% of people 65 and over are home broadband users. Even when you add mobile broadband users, a significant divide still exists both in adoption and the quality of the experience. So as good as smartphones are, they don't provide the same functionality or experience as a large screen device. The Communications Act focuses on certain timeless principles when it comes to media, and those are localism, diversity, and competition. In the modern age, broadband access should be added to that list. Whether it's watching videos for school projects, taking educational courses at home, engaging with friends and family, applying for a job, or utilizing government resources, broadband is becoming a necessity for all Americans. And having broadband available in your neighborhood isn't enough. Consumers should be able to afford the cost of the service and equipment necessary to use the tools of the 21st century. Unfortunately, the current FCC has been actively undermining these principles for Americans. Chairman Pai eliminated the FCC net neutrality rules, which protected consumers, small businesses, and free speech. Net neutrality protected competition and access to the media content, at the focus of the, which is the focus of this hearing. But those protections are gone now. Chairman Pai also proposed to roll back the Lifeline program in a way that could cut phone or internet service for approximately 8.3 million people. And Chairman Pai's actions are not the way to promote access, localism, diversity, and competition. In the area of media ownership, Chairman Pai sided with corporations over consumers and loosened TV ownership rules in ways that undermine competition. The changes encourage more consolidation and less local and diverse viewpoints. And I encourage the FCC to change course and focus on what's important to consumers. For example, the FCC should rethink its bizarre, and I say bizarre, proposal to unwind its safeguards designed to protect children watching broadcast television known as the Kid Vid Rules. The rules require that broadcasters provide three hours of quality educational program per week on their free over-the-air service. And three hours out of the 105 hours of core program in a week, I mean, is that too much to ask? Apparently, Chairman Pai and Commissioner O'Reilly think so. For the 12 million over-the-air households without access to cable programming, I don't think so. For the millions of low-income families without access to broadband alternatives, I don't think so. And I appreciate Jeff Corwin being here today to discuss his experience producing children's programming and the impact the elimination of the Kidbid rules would have on broadcast children's programming. And I also want to thank our other witnesses for appearing before us to discuss the changing media market. And I yield back at this point, Mr. Chairman. The chair thanks the ranking member. That concludes member opening statements.
The chair would like to remind members that pursuant to the committee rules, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. So uh, we want to thank all of our witnesses here today for being here. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to testify before the subcommittee. Today's witnesses will have the opportunity to give opening statements, followed by a round of questioning from the members. Our panel for today's hearing will include uh, Mr. Craig Moffett, who is the founder and research research, uh, senior research analyst at Moffett at Nathanson Research. Welcome, sir. Next, we have Mr. Ian Olgerson, uh, research director at Kagan and Media Research Group within S&P Global Market Intelligence. Welcome, sir. And next, we have Mr. Jeff Corwin, uh, wildlife biologist and executive producer of ABC's Ocean Treks, uh, here on behalf of the Linton Entertainment. Welcome, sir. Uh, we appreciate you all being here today and for preparing testimony for the committee. We will begin with you, Mr. Moffitt, uh, and you're recognized for five minutes for purposes of an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Blackburn and Ranking Member Doyle and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to appear today. Uh, my name is Craig Moffitt. I'm the founder of Moffitt Nathanson. It's a uh, media and telecommunications research firm. I, I want to emphasize my personal focus is the physical distribution side of media, that is cable operators, satellite operators, uh, and telephone companies that operate the physical infrastructure for, uh, for media distribution. Um, I, I've spent 30 years in those industries. I won't go through my, uh, my bio, but it's, uh, it's appended. Um, one of the most popular aphorisms in media is that the media industry has seen more change in the past five years than it had in the, in the previous 50. Um, never mind whether that's accurate. It, 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 it's, it's a call to action, and as a call to action, it's a pretty good one, the argument being change or be left behind. Um, but before getting too breathless about um, how revolutionary all of this is, I, I want to focus my remarks on two of the most important trends, um, the emergence of so-called virtual uh, MVPDs um, and also uh, the trend toward vertical integration um, like uh, AT&T and Time Warner through a decidedly less revolutionary lens, and that is microeconomics. Um, I want to start with the emergence of the MVPDs. Um, the appeal of cord cutting is simple. It's, it's, it's cheaper. And some might argue that it's also about greater consumer control or a step toward, uh, toward a la carte. But the real appeal is, is simpler than that. A bundle of cable networks uh, from uh, an MVPD with a handful of set-top, or, or from a, a, a traditional cable operator with a handful of set-top boxes can typically cost about $100 a month. And the most popular MV, MVPD packages are typically about 40. The problem here is that um, the programming itself doesn't cost any less to produce just because it's being delivered over the internet. Um, nor is it any cheaper for the aggregator, in this case an MV, a virtual MVPD, to buy the content from the content creator. In fact, the MVPDs, uh, virtual MVPDs usually pay more for their content. Um, nor is it any cheaper to deliver by virtue of being delivered over the internet um, instead of so-called linear cable. Remember, the underlying infrastructure uh, remains precisely the same. And in most cases, it, it doesn't even avoid the need for a set-top box. It simply shifts the, the set-top box uh, from the traditional provider to someone like Apple or Roku. Um, when there is no underlying technology or business model reason why the, the new service is cost advantage relative to an old one, um, it pays to be wary. Um, but that said, the services themselves are actually cheaper. So the obvious question is why? Um, partly it's because the packages are smaller, but mostly it's because um, these services are being sold to the consumer um, at zero or negative profit margin. Um, there's an old saying among economists that when something is unsustainable, it will eventually stop. And I guess the real question, as we observe this as economists, is, um, is whether the, the practice of selling these services for a loss will actually turn out to be, um, uh, will turn out to be uh, sustainable. Um, but it, it is clear that all of this is about um, keeping pace with Google and Facebook. Their monetization model for these new services is not to make money on selling video, but to make money on selling advertising. Um, 
either, it, it suggests that, that we're likely to see one of two outcomes. Either Google and Facebook will come to dominate video distribution in a model that's highly, based on highly targeted advertising, and that raises obvious questions about privacy, or the prices of virtual MVPDs will rise significantly to become self-sustaining, um, and in the process, these distinctions between old and new um, won't look as, as significant. Um, a few remarks on uh, the other trend that I mentioned shaking the media business, and that is vertical integration. Um, there's been widespread, uh, widespread speculation that, that we'll see a wave of vertical integration to follow Comcast's acquisition of NBCU in 20, uh, 2010, and, and that speculation has obviously only grown with AT&T's acquisition of DirecTV in 2015, and now, of course, Time Warner. Um, the, I, it's important to view the trend toward vertical integration um, through the, the lens of broader migration of what I would refer to as uh, to uh, closed media systems and, and consider where that's likely to take us. Closed systems dominate almost every important aspect of digital life today. Apple is a closed system, um, once written off for dead versus PCs, but uh, it is now an iOS universe. Facebook is a closed system, uh, so is, is Uber and, and Google. And uh, what we're seeing in the media business is a migration toward closed systems where someone like Facebook produces all, uh, sorry, someone like Netflix produces all their own content and sells it to their own consumers and in the process requires enormous scale to, uh, to amortize risk. I, I would suggest that, that that appears to be where we're headed with the digital platforms, and the real question will become for the traditional media companies, are they forced to go in the same direction? And if so, these ideas where every cable network, for example, is made available to every distribution platform um, will be very difficult to sustain in the face of the emergence of, of these kind of very large closed systems like Netflix, like, uh, like what could potentially be Amazon and others. Um, I'll leave my remarks there, uh, given the time. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Uh, so uh, thank you, Mr. Moffitt. And uh, now I'll recognize Mr. Ian Olberson for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Bill Arrakis and Ranking Member Doyle, thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share information for this hearing. My name is Ian Olgerson, and I'm an industry analyst with Kagan, a media research group within S&P Global Market Intelligence. We provide market commentary, industry benchmarks, and analysis with a particular focus on the changing media landscape. I've been analyzing the U.S. multi-channel market for nearly 20 years. In that period, we've seen online distribution fund fundamentally alter how consumers access content. Alternatives to legacy distribution for video and audio have clearly altered business models as well, and the corporate landscape is shifting in pursuit of increased scale. A pair of recent events nicely illustrate the movement. Comcast's premium bid for Sky in the UK and Amazon's much more subtle enhancement of its Fire TV recast streaming media player in very different ways offer insight into the direction of media. Legacy providers like Comcast and AT&T are doubling down for increased scale on delivery and content, while innovators are giving consumers greater access and control of programming outside of those traditional subscription offers. While the majority of U.S. households still maintain a traditional multi-channel subscription through a cable, telco, or satellite service, often referred to as MVPDs, Online alternatives have eroded the value of the classic big subscription package, driving declines in overall subscribers. Traditional multi-channel subscriptions have fallen from their peak levels of nearly 102 million in 2012 to fewer than 94 million at the end of 2017. Those figures have continued to decline in the first half of 2018. The percentage of occupied households with a traditional subscription have declined to less than 72%, down from a high point of 85% recorded in 2009. Virtual multi-channel services, sometimes referred to as VMVPDs, have risen considerably since 2015, offering a thinner package of channels. 
These services, including DirecTV Now, Sling TV, and Hulu with Live TV, blur the lines between online and traditional services. But it's clear that consumers looking for alternatives have never had more options. At the fore is the programming muscle of Netflix and Amazon Prime Video and the swelling investment in original and acquired content. The investment paves the way for consumers to find alternatives with increasingly fewer sacrifices. However, the legacy providers do have substantial fortifications, including size and reach. There are significant interdependencies with networks and other content, including outright ownership. And in the case of wireline services, they own critical broadband infrastructure. As a result, the video market is still in the early to mid stages of a complex process that shouldn't be oversimplified. Thank you for, your opportuni for the opportunity to provide this statement. I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Ogleson. Now we'll uh, hear from uh, Mr. Jeff Corwin. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes, uh, sir, for your opening statement. Thank you for having me. I truly appreciate it. Millions of parents, educators, and children rely on the content protected by the Children's Television Act as their most trusted outlet for educational and informational programming. There is an effort underway to dismantle one of the most important public service obligations Congress placed on broadcasters as a condition for their license serving the needs of children. I speak today not just as a biologist, as a conservationist, explorer, and a father, but also as one of those kids who has benefited from those programs. When I was growing up, my dad worked as a printer by day, delivered Dunkin' Donuts at night, and took classes to become a Boston police officer, for which he served proudly for more than 35 years. My mom worked as a registered nurse at Quincy City Hospital, putting herself to school as well. So, my sister and I, we spent a lot of our time in our triple-decker with our black and white TV becoming a bit of a de facto babysitter. Shows like Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins had a powerful impact on introducing me to the natural world and influencing my own life's journey. The TV programs that we make are loaded with that same inspiration, germinating the next generation of innovators, educators, engineers, entrepreneurs, and leaders like yourselves. I've had the good fortune to spend the last 20 years working on shows uh, around the world for Disney, Discovery, Food Network, Animal Planet, CNN, but I'm most proud of the work that I have done with CTA. As we know, our children are naturally curious. They thirst for learning, and our mission is to feed that innate passion, thus inspiring these children to have rewarding and productive futures, which ultimately contributes to our society. Lytton's educational programs received more than one and a half billion views just last year. And this motivates future leaders and visionaries. And many of these begin as children in rural America or in urban environments, often without access to internet technologies. Some of them are, of course, kids that are at-risk teens. The CTA has spurred a virtual classroom filled with incredible teachers and experts that engage millions of children every week. And we do so with enthusiasm, compassion, humor. And this deepens the learning experience. We choose, we intend, our mission is to produce television for teens. We believe providing teens and their families with safe, educational, and inspirational content is vital. Today, when social media and celebrity are often considered more valuable than education and innovation, and when teens are only a single click away from the digital unknown, this programming is more critical than ever. We fear that if the KidVid NPRM is not rectified, stations will no longer dedicate time serving our children, and shows like mine, Ocean Treks, and ABC will be replaced from infomercials such as MyPillow.com. However, we are confident that there is a way for the FCC to provide flexibility for broadcasters without diminishing the quality of programming and Congress's, your commitment to our children. While we support efforts that lessen the burdens on television stations, we strongly oppose broadcasters' move to take 
the EI programming multicast channel as our primary mode of distribution and rolling back the three-hour rule. Multicast viewership is 95% less programming carried compared to the primary program stream. Without those viewers, we offer no value to our sponsors and to our advertisers. For example, on the main screen primary format, a commercial would sell for $2,500. On the multicast channel, that commercial is reduced to $25. Congress charged broadcasters with offering educational content for children. In order to stay true to this mission, we must keep our program current. Simple, but if we move the educational program to multicast, original programming will come to an end. It will cease to exist. Our virtual classroom will be obsolete. Broadcast television is uniquely powerful and can be a beacon for inspiration and enlightenment. I ask you, just 2% a broadcast time, is that too much to ask to provide for our children? When Mr. Rogers was here 50 years ago, he discussed the impact that media is having on children way back then in 1969. Imagine if he was here today, what he would witness with the impact of media, which is why the program we deliver is so vitally important. I thank you so much for your time today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, and I, I thank all your witnesses, all the witnesses for their testimony today. And before I begin questioning, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter the following documents into the record for Mr. Scalise. A letter from the Center for Individual Freedom, Council for Citizens Against Government Waste, and a press release from the National Taxpayers Union. Without objection, so ordered. Now I'd like to uh, begin my questioning. Uh, first question will be for Mr. Olgerson. It is very clear that consumers have many different options to get their video content. Can you talk a little bit about how the market is impacted by generational viewing habits? For example, my district is home to many seniors uh, in retirement. Are there certain age groups that are driving subscriber growth or subscriber losses. I know that the youth uh, is probably number one, but if you can explain, I'd appreciate it very much. Sure. So uh, I think that it, it is it is um, uh, difficult to ascribe a specific demographic to the the people that are leaving the multi-channel environment. Um, uh, the common wisdom is that it's younger people. Um, uh, and that and that part of the decline of multi-channel has to do with um, uh, younger uh, people leaving a multi-channel service, and the other part has to do with the fact that they're not fueling new subscribers as as older subscribers churn off. Um, uh, we have seen um, certainly uh, 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 evidence, survey evidence of of younger people embracing over-the-top video more frequently than. Um, than older people. If we look at uh, a recent survey, it shows that um, uh, uh, that that the seniors, sort of over 72 years old, tend to be more engaged with multi-channel services. Uh, they tend to be less engaged with with the subscriber VOD services like Netflix. Um, uh, and so uh, we certainly have that evidence. We've also seen that uh, both. Uh, younger generations like Gen Z and Millennials tend to be about the same, have the same satisfaction rate with their multi-channel services as seniors, which is an interesting fact, um, an interesting finding. Um, and, and, but seniors seem to find more value within those multi-channel services. Uh, so it, it, we have seen a, a senior class that, that uh, tends to stay closer to uh, the multi-channel services than, uh, than their younger um, demographics. I thank you. A follow-up here. How are content creators and video providers adapting to these changes? Are they adapting to the changes? How, how are they adapting to these uh, changes? Well, I, I think that we've certainly seen the, um, the, the multi-channel service providers like Comcast um, and Charter um, uh, integrating their own um, access to over-the-top features. Um, we've seen them introduce, uh, on a limited basis, their own uh, skinny bundles. Um, Comcast has its Instant TV initiative, which is meant to look um, and feel similar to a virtual service like, uh, like a Hulu with live TV. 
Um, so we've seen, we've seen that. They've invested in improved user interfaces to try to, to match some of the, um, the functionality that they get from Netflix. Um, so we've seen a variety of different, uh, of, of different offerings from operators. Thank you. Our next question is for uh, Mr. Moffitt. Uh, you talked in your testimony about a transition to closed media with more and more content owners moving to a closed system like Netflix or uh, Hulu. Uh, but consumers must have individual subscriptions with all of these providers. That's correct, right? Uh, which leads to the question of subscription uh, fatigue. Do you have any thoughts on this, how the industry can respond to the overload of subs subscriptions as we move to a closed uh, system? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's a, it's a fantastic question, and the answer is uh, I think the entire industry writ large is grappling with exactly that question. You know, Disney, for example, has talked about the, an expectation that they will increasingly be a direct-to-consumer company. HBO is, is increasingly, or in fact, arguably always has been to some degree a direct-to-consumer company as, as, uh, as is to a degree Showtime, but all of them are, are in effect um, aiming at becoming direct-to-consumer platforms um, that will increasingly look like closed systems, as, as by the way will Netflix, where Netflix is, is licensing less content uh, certainly as a share of its total business from others and producing more and more of it themselves. So the question of what the future looks like, it's, it's very hard for us to get our heads around the idea that we might have a model where at AT&T, for example, the only way you would be able to get CNN is if you were a subscriber to an AT&T platform uh, and you ended up with an exclusivity platform like that, or the only way you could get uh, NBC would be to, uh, to be a subscriber to Comcast, and that if you had to choose between the two, it would mean I'm either going to have one or the other, because adding them together may be un uh, rather unwieldy. That is so different than, uh, than the model that we've all grown up with that most people find it to be almost unimaginable. Um, but in effect, all of the competitors of the traditional companies are going in that direction. And so what the traditional companies are struggling with is, are we gonna be forced to go in that direction as well? And I don't think anybody has a good answer yet for, for what that looks like, how many subscriptions the average person is likely to be willing to bear. Those are all very, very open questions at this point. All right, thank you very much. My, my time has expired. Uh, now I yield five minutes to the ranking Mr. Mr. Doyle. Yeah. Mr. Corwin, um, as I understand it, TV stations contract Lytton, uh, who you're testifying on behalf of, to provide them with children's television content to meet their kid vid obligations, right? And, and the way that Lytton pays to produce new content is by selling advertisements during these broadcasts, right? Yes. So, um, now, one part of the FCC's proposal regarding KidVid is to allow broadcasters to meet that KidVid obligation by broadcasting this content on one of their multicast stations. Now, I've heard that there's a pretty significant difference in value between main station and multicast advertising revenue. Is that accurate? And if so, how big of a difference are we talking about? Well, there's a tremendous challenge with trying to rely on multicast as a way to broadcast, but uh, you know, I can tell you, you know, from my, my personal experience, uh, I find that people are very excited to be engaged in this material, and I, and I hope that none of your constituents are responding to you saying they're getting too much educational television. Um, right, but what I'm interested in is what's the difference in the advertising revenues, whether they are broadcast? They're huge. Um, the, the advertising revenue can be uh, from, from $2,000 plus per commercial to $25. Why does that break down? So much, well, that's because you lose your audience. Multicast is not available on cable. It's not available in satellite. It's rarely broadcasted in HD. We lose 98% of the market. My own children, where I live in Massachusetts, would not be able to watch my television program. So, so then my question is, do you think that you and other content producers uh, could continue to make high quality children's television content for broadcasters under KidVid if you were just working with ad revenue for multicast stations? We could not. In fact, 
what we do is we actually generate our own income and which the networks do not have to pay for. We are self-sustaining, but because we would no longer have the, the marketplace, we would no longer have the viewership, we would no longer be competitive, and we wouldn't get those ad dollars. The reason why I get the money to make the TV shows that we do is by having a strong, robust, highly competitive viewing audience, and that goes away in multicast. Well, representing the district where Fred Rogers lived, uh, I'll ask you, do you think there's value in children having access to safe educational original programming on free over-the-air broadcast television? I do. There are millions of children that uh, get this information. I can tell you, Mr. Doyle, I was in filming in Pennsylvania just a couple of weeks ago filming the Hellbender, which is a remarkable species of salamander that tells us all about science, technology, and research, both in the ancient past of evolution and today in modern wildlife management. We get to tell that story in a compelling way through my TV show because we have the budget to be able to travel and invest in these stories. That goes away through multicast. Yeah, why well, I, I, I agree that I think there's great benefit to having that kind of program over the air uh, on, on free television. And uh, I, just, I just close by saying I'm glad that Pirates don't have to play the Red Sox this year. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know uh, we have votes being called, so I'll yield back. We're going to get one more in. We'll get the, uh, I'll recognize the full, full chairman of the committee, Mr. Walden, for five minutes, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thanks to our witnesses. Uh, this is part of a very vibrant discussion we're going to be having on this committee um, in the, the weeks and months and probably years ahead about the changing video marketplace and what it looks like, what it can look like, what it will look like, uh, what we can envision it should be, and then what are the regulations in place today? Do they make sense for today? Do they make sense for tomorrow? Who's covered? Who's not? Um, these were always the, the challenges in public policy we, we, uh, we get confronted with. I, uh, I loved Wild Kingdom, too. Um, you know, I, it was on the air from, uh, I think it was 1963 to 1988, and we always watched it, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. They had that little advertising plug in there every time. I think KidVid actually came in 1990, uh, so the law that you referenced actually was enacted in 1990. And I guess as I, I look at this marketplace, gosh, there's never been more opportunities for all kinds of programming at your fingertips as long as you have connectivity and, and internet. Um, so it's a pretty exciting time, unless you're stuck on your brick phone. <coughs> Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, So, Mr. Moffat, uh, critics of, <laughs> yeah, he's still paying for AOL, too. Mr. Moffat, critics of uh, industry consolidation, could we have order here, Mr. Chairman? Critics of industry consolidation have claimed that the combination of large firms who provide both content and distribution platforms is anti-competitive and puts too much power in the hands of a few. But we don't often talk about the impact that new entrants are having on the same marketplace. Google's YouTube platform is the largest video network in the world, and it is, in, uh, it is enhanced by two billion Android phone devices that come pre-installed with the YouTube app. Amazon's Prime reaches two-thirds of American households now, and both of these companies have market caps several times larger than the biggest telecom media companies. Can you comment on big tech's increasing presence in the video market and how this impacts competition? Yeah, thank you for the question. I, 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 look, it is very clear that the moves that you've seen from companies like AT&T and Comcast have been precisely to respond yeah. to the fact that the scale and, and market power of companies like Google and Facebook um, are, are, in fact, much greater than their own. Um, and what I described in my, my uh, witness statement of, uh, of a model that, or, or what an economist would call the monetization theory based on uh, advertising and, and uh, you know, the old adage that, uh, that, that if the product is free, you're the product. Um, right, right. In fact, the yes. consumer yes. is the product that is right. being sold in most of these models. It's data. Um, they may not be entirely free, but all of the economic value is effectively predicated on the assumption that there will be a resale of the customer data, what you watch and what you do. Um, that is extraordinarily difficult for the traditional companies to respond to. And what you're seeing is a, is a sort of a different model. The consolidation is, is more defensive than offensive among the large companies. They're trying to respond by doing the traditional things of getting bigger and cutting costs. 
um, and hoping, in the case of AT&T, that there is a, a, a path for them to be truly competitive as, as, a, as an advertising platform. Um, but it is very difficult for them as a competence to be as, as successful in the advertising business uh, as the digital advertisers, Facebook and Google in particular, are. And you've talked about the, the rise of virtual M MP MVPDs and how they're becoming popular with consumers, but you said the service is losing money, so it may not be sustainable, but yet it seems like Wall Street has supported business models that lose money. Um, as, they, as long as they keep growing their user base, I, I think about Amazon and Snapchat and the way they leverage their capital to keep garnering market share. Um, it, it's phenomenal what they've done in, in so many respects. Do you think Wall Street will give virtual MVPDs the same benefit or does a different set of rules apply? Well, it, it, I think for now, I, the, the Wall Street is generally skeptical of the virtual MVPD model, at least the live version that's, that's distinct from the Netflix model. So the Netflix model, which is in Wall Street parlance an SVOD model or subscription video on demand, particularly when they're producing their own content. It's a fixed cost being, being uh, amortized across a larger and larger base. Right. By contrast, the virtual MVPDs are essentially a variable cost. And so if you lose money on one customer, having 100 million customers is still gonna lose money. <laughs> You're losing money on every You don't line. make it up on volume. And so scale doesn't help. And so right. Wall Street is quite skeptical, I think for the moment, of any of the virtual MVPD models. In a, in, in the context of a company like Google, YouTube TV um, is too small for anyone to spend much time on it. But a big part of the reason, for example, that AT&T um, as an equity has, has performed so poorly since its DirecTV acquisition isn't just that DirecTV started to shrink right after they bought it, but because they started to migrate customers into an, a virtual MVPD of their own, DirecTV Now, that was hemorrhaging money. And so the, the, the income statement looked, frankly, quite awful, um, partly because of that acquisition. So Wall Street has not been willing to fund the, the expansion of the traditional companies into this business. Um, right. the, 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 I've gone over my And hasn't paid much time. attention to the digital companies doing it. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank I'll you. Back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. And now we'll recognize the ranking member, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know that we have a vote on, so I'm going to only use about half the time, and I'm going to limit my questions to uh, Mr. Corwin. Uh, I want to thank you for your excellent programming that you provided to America's children over the years. Um, and I agree with you that uh, my concern that you share is that the FCC, in considering rolling back protections that ensure kids have access to free educational and informational TV program, is a serious problem. Um, so let me just say, if educational children's program migrated online or to cable channel only, what groups of children would be the most affected? Uh, would be the people most affected are the ones that do not have access to, to the technology. Um, and as we've discovered with the potential opportunities of multicast is that there's no opportunity for broadcast because we just wouldn't have our audience. So unless you're in a public library or you're at a school, there are many children in our country that uh, would, not have would not have access to this technology. And what's the consequence of that? In other words, children from lower income homes as you say, have access to fewer resources and opportunities than wealthier families. So in your experience, you know, how, how, how does exposure to educational program mandated by KidVid rules actually benefit the children? So how does it benefit children? Okay, so the only thing I could say is, in my job, I don't wear a suit. This is the first time I've worn a suit. I always say you never want to see me in a suit because you're probably in a casket. But, uh, but I needed a suit. I was filming overseas. My wife got a suit. I came home. It didn't fit. And uh, I couldn't find a tailor. I found a tailor at the last minute. She was able to do it. I didn't think she knew who I was. I got a text for her saying, you can pick it up on the 26th in the afternoon. And she said, uh, by the way, I don't know if this is inappropriate, but would you provide a correspondence uh, to my nephew because uh, he serves in special ops and he wanted you to know that when he was a teenager, he was going through some tough times and your programming and others inspired him to focus 
and he joined the military now as a very productive career. I mean, that's a personal story that I've encountered. I've met many children. Uh, I've met many, unfortunately, now that I'm aging, you meet adults that come up to you say, I became a veterinarian or I became a scientist because of shows like yours that I've experienced. So on a personal note, I've met hundreds, if not thousands, of people that have been positively impacted. When it comes to our natural resources, I'll tell you this. Uh, you can't protect and you can't wisely use what you do not love. And if you don't love it, uh, you'll never love it if you never realize it or discover it. And that's what shows like mine do. We provide a vehicle, a safe, encouraging, rich environment for young children and young people to make discoveries that per could perhaps set them on the careers of what they will do in the future. I think that's so important. And you know, the other thing we, we, we realize more and more, at least I do, I think most people do, is that when you talk about STEM, right, in other words, you know, science, uh, engineering, the things, uh, that, that kind of education that's so important, um, you know, for the future in a sort of innovative technology world, what this committee deals with, um, that's where a lot of these kids, we, we know that in, you know, STEM education is something that low-income kids uh, often don't, don't have the opportunity to don't hear about, don't start, you know, wondering about science and nature and all that. And um, so I think it has a, a particular impact there because I, I worry so much that, you know, the people from low-income backgrounds will never get into those fields. And the sort of discovery aspect that you're talking about, I think, is particularly important in that respect as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for yielding back. And now I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, my, oh, excuse me, El, uh, Louisiana, my good friend, Mr. Scalise. Five minutes, please. Thanks again, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the, uh, the testimony that y'all have given and, and really described just how much things have changed uh, since the brick was the cell phone. This was the last time our laws were written. These are the laws. We're literally operating under 1992 laws with this technology. And I show this to show the importance of why we need to update our laws. And, you know, obviously I filed a bill, the, the Next Generation Television Marketplace, to start this conversation about how we get beyond these people that want to live in the dark ages. The number one song, by the way, when the 1992 Cable Act was written, ironically, was End of the Road by Boys to Men. Uh, it is the end of the road for the 92 Cable Act, but we can't keep living under it because those companies that are fighting that change. Mr. Moffitt, you said in, in your statement earlier, change or get left behind. And really that's fitting because it seems like some of the people that think that they're protected by the 92 Cable Act, that, that want to hide behind the 92 Cable Act and fight to protect it, uh, they're going to fight change while they're getting left behind because the change is happening. The problem is you have very different sets of rules that everybody's playing by. Uh, why is it, and, and I think Mr. Olgerson, you did some research to look at how many people are really cutting the cord, what kind of drop there is. And from what I saw, there's about a 9% drop reduction in people uh, that are staying within the old MVPD marketplace. In other words, the cutting of the cord is real and they're doing it, but they're not just stopping and watching things. They're transferring over to over the top. And I think in your studies, it was somewhere around 180% increase in the number of people going to over the top. And so there was a revenue study that was done by Convergence Research Group that showed a revenue change last year. Uh, a 1% increase in pay TV, the, the traditional MVPD, and a 41% increase in revenues by over the top. The more alarming part for the traditional revenue, uh, the traditional MVPD folks, you know, while they may be saying, hey, we had a 1% increase, that's a decrease in what they were getting before, but they're losing customers by a rapid, rapid rate. And so if you look at where we should be trying to go, we should be trying to go to a marketplace where everybody has the same set of rules. One of the reasons that those traditional MVPDs can't go find ways to get more customers that are getting better choices. I mean, customers do what they always do. They look for better choices and they look for lower costs. And they're finding both in the, over the top, but they can't get it in the traditional MVPD because there are laws in the 92 Cable Act uh, like must carry, like basic tier. There are actual laws that prevent you from providing the services that customers are looking for. 
So they're cutting the cord because they can go somewhere else. So Mr. Moffitt, what I wanna ask you is as I've described that marketplace, uh, explain to me maybe why you see some of these traditional MVPDs fighting change that frankly the change, they, they're gonna be blockbuster. You know, you, you, you know, Chairman Walden, I know he, he gave that example of blockbuster. Uh, blockbuster died for a reason because they fought the change that was happening. It happened anyway. And so as people moved away, Blockbuster went away because they fought the change. If they maybe would have said, let's go be like Netflix, then maybe they could be like Netflix today instead of being the dinosaur. So if you want to maybe touch on that, Mr. Moffitt. Well, it, thank you for the question. And, and I would say, in fact, part of the reason that uh, the change has seemed, particularly to people in the tech community, um, has seemed a bit glacial for, for the traditionals is precisely as you say, there are, there are very real um, limitations on their degrees of freedom, right? As a, as a traditional MVPD, um, a, a, a Comcast or a charter or, or something, um, I might want to, for example, respond to the emergence of so-called skinny bundles among the OTT players by saying, well, I have to have skinnier bundles of my own with fewer networks. Well, your contracts don't allow that, um, so you probably can't. And maybe that worked when you were the monopoly. You know, again, in 1992, you didn't even have satellite. Stella That's didn't right. exist. Was... Uh, you surely didn't have Roku and Hulu and all those other services. You had one place to go, you, and you were the only game in town. And so it was a great relationship with the networks. They were a monopoly, you were a monopoly, and everybody could only go to you. And by that the doesn't way, exist anymore. And the negotiating leverage, as you can imagine, in those days was quite different. Um, it, one of the challenges for the traditional MVPDs in competing is, as they think about the retrans rules, for example, you have a very clear asymmetry in the negotiating leverage. The, the media company, the, the, the local, I should say, the, the local broadcast affiliate, particularly in, in NFL markets where they have the rights to um, to a local football game is dealing with a product um, that for which there is no substitute by by law there is no one else allowed to sell that NFL game for example in that market um, and they're negotiating with a player on the on the uh, multi-channel video side a cable operator or a satellite operator for whom there are very obvious and and identifiable substitutes so that's quite different than the situation in 1992, and, and not I know, surprisingly. And I apologize, I know I'm out of time, but just to say, uh, to wrap it up, Mr. Chairman, uh, let's get back to a free market where everybody's paid for their content. I mean, let's go to pure copyright. We're not talking about somebody giving away their product for free, uh, but no, let's not have the government tell you that you have to provide content one way, but this other actor over here that's going through the internet can operate in a completely different set of rules and environment and take your customers away, but you're trapped in the old system. Let's have a free market for everybody where you get fully compensated for your, for your content, uh, but update the laws because my gosh, why are we still operating under these laws? It's the end of the road. You'll back. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scalise. And uh, as you know, votes have been called, so we'll take a slight recess. Uh, the subcommittee will recess uh, for, well, a few minutes. Thank <laughs> you.